asking the right question and and um, having that uh, passion for asking hard questions and being prepared that you'll never get the answer. So you, mm. you are wondering about nature. And uh, once you have that uh, good idea after many years of, of struggling with bad ideas, uh, then uh, then you sit down and do the math of it. So the, the math will be the last stage in that chain. Right. So, so if you have an idea about how something works in nature, you can use math to sort of prove whether or not your theory is accurate. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, and, and then uh, you go beyond that and uh, you look for experimental proof of your ideas as well. Is there is there experimental uh, possibilities to prove some of these amazing sort of theoretical um, um, physics, you know, ideas that we have like string theory, for example? Like I've always heard that string theory is the best one because nobody can ever prove it wrong, right? And, and you mm -hmm. know that it's that. So, like, are there possible um, like levels of experimentation that we can reach to actually start proving some of these things? Yes, that that was uh, uh, one contribution of of my work and my theory. And uh, in fact, it's what got other people excited about this work. What uh, got me excited was. Uh, the fact that for the first time we were able to derive the answer to the origin of our universe mathematically and uh, theoretically. But um, it, as part of that theory, of course, uh, I and collaborators had to show uh, ways of testing that mm -hmm. theory experimentally. And uh, until this work came along, the general belief, as you said, whether it was the string theory aspect or, uh, or the existence of the multiverse, the general belief until uh, this work had been that even if there is such a thing as other universes or, or a time before the Big Bang when, when something happened, we'll never know because we, we can't see beyond the Big Bang and, and sure. we can't see beyond the edge of our universe. And um, uh, I, I had this uh, idea that I describe in the book uh, in, in a coffee shop that um, all th if our universe started small, which we know for certain it did, then uh, it can be described with quantum mechanics as a wave. But mm -hmm. it's not the only wave. There, there are many branches to the wave function of the universe. Each one of those uh, is about to become a universe on its own, to acquire its own identity. Uh, in quantum mechanics, all these branches uh, are entangled with each other through quantum entanglement. Mm -hmm. So as they grow, go through their individual big banks and grow to produce large classical universes and, and shed away their quantum nature, somehow they also have to wipe out this quantum entanglement that they have with their neighbors. Uh, this process of... of um, washing out entanglement is known as the coherence in, in physics, but it happens at exactly the time when each of those waves, including our own universe, goes through cosmic inflation and it grows and uh, quantum fluctuations of that inflation energy are the ones that will produce uh, light and matter later on. So, the, in short, this early quantum entanglement will leave its trace on all the structure that will be produced within the universe. Mm. And we estimated how strong that quantum entanglement was early on. Then since we have a coherent history of our universe from before the Big Bang, through the Big Bang, and beyond the Big Bang to present day, we can simply follow the story on how those dents, that scarring from quantum entanglement will look like in our sky today. So we, we showed for the first time that you don't need to travel beyond the edge of the universe in order to find um, wow. evidence of the multiverse. It's actually right here. It can be found here in our sky as, as fingerprints of, of that multiverse. In uh, Whenever we look at temperature maps of the sky that um, give us a very good idea of how matter is distributed, whether it's galaxies, stars, clusters, and so on, then uh, we, we can see how that story that we expect from Big Bang, how that has been modified or dented due to this quantum entanglement. And, and we calculated and we predicted a series of scars. One of those was uh, the existence of a large area in the sky that is about 10 degrees. Now, 10, 10 degrees in the sky is quite a large area. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, we predicted that that should be a giant void. It should be empty of uh, stars and galaxies and matter. So it should show as a cold spot in the temperature maps of the sky. And indeed, that was uh, confirmed with the Planck satellite experiment in 2013 and 2018. And, and by now, as far as uh, the Planck satellite data is concerned, that's a discovery, the existence wow. of the cold spot, yeah. Okay, so, so just to make sure, because I can wrap my head around this, um, because this is quite fascinating. You're saying that at the beginning, there, there's like a sound coming from the background. Is that is that? Yeah, I, I can't control that. That's. Uh... Oh, okay. Don't worry about it. If you can't control it, then don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, so, so at the big, because the way that I've always understood, sort of the wave of probability, is that the wave of probability has all of these possible permutations of where a molecule can be at any point in time, mm -hmm. but the wave of probability uh, crashes until it actually reaches a single point. And that single point is the reality that actually exists. But what you're saying is that that wave of probability crashed an infinite amount of times and all of these points and all of these things that created their own unique big bangs mm -hmm. actually have quantum entanglement that can be seen by us relative to the other ones that are out there. Yeah. So uh, that that was uh, the the old way of uh, of uh, trying to choose the classical universe out of uh, quantum mechanics, and it's known oh, as the, as the collapse of the wave function of the universe, and that was uh, put forward by Niels Bohr actually. And uh, the idea was that whatever branches you have in that wave function, each one of those is capable of producing a universe. But the moment you make a measurement, the moment you observe yes. that uh, wave function, then you know for sure that this branch is sitting at this point. So you have collapsed it. Instead of a myriad of uh, possibilities, you have collapsed it to one single choice, that the one that you are observing yeah. right now. That's always how I understood quantum physics in the way yeah. of... Uh, but you're saying that that's completely wrong. No, and, and it's not only me saying that. Uh, in fact, uh, the first person to, to really make a breakthrough um, insight in, into that uh, picture and what's wrong with that picture was you have at the third. In, oh, wow. in the 50s when uh, he was a PhD student under John Wheeler. And uh, in fact, he, he got into a lot of uh, discussions and troubles with, uh, with Niels Bohr, who did not <laughs> like uh, Everett's criticism. But, but here is the, the issue. Think of Schrodinger's cat. You put the cat in a box. Quantum yep. mechanically, uh, you have a 50% chance, say, that the cat is alive inside the box and 50% chance that is dead. Mm -hmm. Uh, all those possibilities combine together into a wave function that describes the cat. Now, according to Bohr, the moment somebody from outside the box opens the box and, and looks at the cat, they know for sure whether the cat is alive or dead. So that state of being of the cat becomes the only possibility after the measurement, after it's been observed. Yeah. Uh, Hugh Everett, and that's the, the famous Schrodinger's cat experiment, um, Hugh Everett um, criticized that way of thinking because you are using double standards in physics. You are treating the cat inside the box as a quantum object, but you are treating the observer outside the box that is making the observation, the measurement, as a classical object. Right. You, you are raising that uh, observer in, in a uh, podium where he has the right, I mean, it can be another object in the measurement, but uh, that observer has the right to decide whether the cat is alive or dead. So according to you, Everett, that, that was uh, wrong and then double standards in physics. So Everett, in his many worlds of uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics, suggested, let's agree whatever your liking is, but let's agree in one set of rules that the world is either governed by quantum rules or by classical rules. But you can't have both, where half of the objects are treated quantum mechanically and the other half are, are treated classically. Mm -hmm. So in that case, he said, imagine this cat experiment. And, and that was uh, an experiment that uh, Einstein had liked so much that uh, he suggested, instead of uh, the cat being dead or alive, he suggested, how about you, you put uh, some... Um, 
uh, what is it called, gunpowder inside. So you, you blow up the cat in, in many little bits. So you have got all these possibilities. Can all these bits be recombined to create uh, the cat as it was before? So you, you, you can get carried away and then think of all the various scenarios of what can happen to that cat inside. But according to you, Everett, whatever happens to that cat, the observer has to be treated by the exact same rules, mm. by the same standards as the cat inside the box. In fact, he said, for that matter, the observer can be another cat. So you've got a cat outside the box and the cat inside the box. The cat outside the box is making a measurement on the cat inside the box. But since both obey quantum rules, then the cat inside the box is doing the same thing to the cat outside. So both cats are observing and measuring each other. In that case, the wave functions of both cats are entangled together into a mm -hmm. larger wave function. So all these possibilities then become reality. And, and that was wow. the, the many worlds of uh, quantum mechanics that uh, in uh, popular culture now has become known as parallel universes where every time you have a thought in your head, you are splitting that wave function of the universe to create another parallel universe in which you are doing exactly what you're thinking of doing. Right, right. Because I've always understood that in theory, but I've always kind of applied to your point, the sort of classical way of looking at it, that once the wave function collapses, then it ceases to exist. The possibility of it doesn't exist outside of the current yeah. like space where that molecule exists. Yeah. But what you're saying is that there's been experimental um a proof that it's actually wrong that that the right way of looking at it is that not only do does the wave function uh collapse into an infinite amount of possibilities but all of those possibilities are actually entangled with each other and yeah. can actually affect each other in yeah. certain ways that that yeah. you can see like you said scarring from one parallel universe affecting our universe yes that's correct and then that that was uh, exactly what uh, got everyone excited and, and uh, one of the contributions on moving the research on on the idea of a multiverse to mainstream science until recently that that belonged in philosophy rather than science yes. but once we showed that you can you can actually test it experimentally and you don't need to travel beyond the horizon of our and, universe and could you explain that to me one more time what the basic experiment is that is used to test this theory yes. so uh, in everything we we uh, test our theories of the universe uh, the cosmic microwave background plays a major role and yes. what uh, the cosmic microwave uh, background is just the afterglow of creation. At, at the moment of the Big Bang, uh, our universe is a very tiny, smooth patch of space, but full of energies. Energy is, is a very mysterious ingredient. It's something we are not familiar with in, in daily life. Because um, unlike matter that likes to crunch everything to one point under its own weight, energy does the opposite. It, it blows things up. So in, mm -hmm. in that sense, it has anti-gravity, if you like. Now you are in a situation where you have a small uh, patch of space and you have a lot of energy. In it. So that small patch of space blows up very quickly under the gravitational properties of that energy. As as um, as it grows, being since it started small, it's also a quantum object, so it will have a lot of fluctuations. And as it's blowing up and producing a large universe, that's the story of cosmic inflation. Those fluctuations are also rescaling with the size of the universe. As the universe grows, continues to grow, the temperature in the universe drops down. So many of these fluctuations. If you happen to have a lot of them in, in one small uh, region of space, they will collapse, condense under their own gravity, under their own weight. And that's how structure in the universe was formed. Galaxies, stars, planets, us ultimately came out of that story of quantum fluctuations producing structure. But it's not only matter that uh, these fluctuations contain. Uh, they also contain radiation, light, so that light is left over and it permeates every corner of the universe as we speak. It's, it's the afterglow of creation because it's a leftover from the moment of creation, mm -hmm. but it, it 
it is all around us today. In fact, in the old days, the, the younger people won't remember that. So they won't know what I'm talking about, but in the older days when uh, we had TV sets with antennas and we were trying to get a signal and we, we, we couldn't, we got that bzzz on, on, on the screen. Right. That bzzz is ac actually it's the cosmic microwave background. It was the radiation <laughs> of empty space that, that we were capturing on, on uh, television. Now, all these satellite experiments that I mentioned, the Planck satellite that is a European-based experiment and is the most recent one. Before that, it was uh, the US-based uh, WMAP satellite. And uh, before that, uh, very early on, the COBE experiment. All of those are designed to just take temperature maps of this radiation that is left over from creation of the mm -hmm. CMB. As, as they take pictures of that uh, radiation, they expect a very uniform distribution of matter and light throughout the universe. Because just remember the story I, I described. You start small, you blow up uniformly to the current size. Mm -hmm. So everything, all, all those fluctuations that produce matter and light, they should also be spread uniformly throughout the universe. Sure. When I look at the sky tonight, I should see a very uniform sprinkling of, of the stars in, in my night sky. Any, any scarring from structures or from interactions of the whole universe with other universes in the multiverse, that would break that uniformity to tilt or scar that picture. And that's exactly how Planck was able to, to observe that all in all, of course, there is a uniform distribution of matter and light, but there are certain areas, especially at the largest scales in the universe, where uniformity is violated. And, and uh, we had already predicted that, and, and that gave power to our predictions because it wasn't a post hoc explanation after it was observed, but we predicted that in 2005 and then it was observed a decade la later. And the prediction comes from um, alternate universes that are also created at the exact moment of the Big Bang, or is it possible that it's other universes that are older than our universe or younger, for example. Ah, now you are getting in, into probably the most difficult question in physics and philosophy <laughs> that has been going on uh, for many, many thousands of years. And nobody to this day knows the answer. So you are talking about time and time scales. Were right. things created before and after? And, and uh, I have to be very careful there because even now, my community is divided in, in yeah. two main camps. Uh, there is a camp that says... And like one of your books focuses a lot on this, right? The Arrows yes. of Time? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, that, that's a textbook. It's not a popular science book. And then oh, that is based in a conference that I organized with uh, Brian Green and Justin Kauri at, oh, yeah. uh, at the New York uh, National Academy of Science on, on the question of time. What is time? And we, we handpicked experts world experts on the topic and after a week still we could not find two people in the room that agreed with each other on this topic yeah brian green when i when i interviewed brian green he told me something i'll never forget that he thinks that the next great wave of science will be around a further understanding of time that, absolutely that absolutely because it's one of those pillars i mean everything we describe whether it's the multiverse that you just asked me about is is in space and in time somehow space is a more familiar object because it's all around us but uh, time is, is a, a, a huge mystery the two camps in physics and and that goes back to the pillars of modern physics and that mm -hmm. is einstein's theory of gravity and quantum theory in Einstein's gravity, the moment you approach a certain very high energy known as Planck energy, it is just given by uh, the inverse of Newton's constant of gravity. But the moment you approach that, which is at the center of a black hole or at energies near the Big Bang, then the whole theory breaks down. You, you end up with a singularity. So according to, to that view, uh, time stops there, whether it's the center of the black hole or the Big Bang. In, mm -hmm. in other words, if you believe that Einstein's theory is the final description of, uh, of our universe, then time is an emergent parameter. 
It did not exist before our universe existed. And therefore your question, what were the other universes doing before, does not, cannot be answered. It doesn't make sense. If, mm. if time emerged with our universe. Oh, I see. Because just, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you're saying that because if we all agree that if you rewind time back to the Big Bang, where everything is in an infinite kind of point in space, yeah. it's impossible for there to be time yeah. because there's so much gravity, so much energy is yeah. preventing the concept of time from emerging. That's exactly correct, yes. Got it, got it. Wow, okay. But if you are in the other camp of uh, physicists that say, no, quantum theory is the final word in, in, in describing the universe, then in quantum theory, time takes a very crucial role, but uh, a very mysterious role because it's put there by hand. But uh, it's a fundamental parameter. You cannot write down any quantum equations unless you introduce this time parameter. Oh, so wow. it's fundamental. You just yeah. gave me chills. I didn't even know that. that. That's so awesome. I didn't know that. I didn't know that time is like a necessary variable to, to understand quantum physics. I didn't know that. Yeah. In, in fact, uh, every, th every equation you write relates the energy of, of your object, of your quantum system, whether it's the whole universe or one electron, it doesn't matter. But uh, every equation will relate that energy to time, to time parameter. So in that sense, time is fundamental. It's always been there. It's just a parameter, but it's always been there. And then we get into bigger troubles, which is we have an era of time in our universe. Right. We can, which means the direction of time. We can tell the difference between yesterday and tomorrow. Uh, we can tell the difference between the universe 13 billion years ago when it was tiny, 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 and the present universe, which is large. So what determines that direction of time, that mm. era of time from past to future? It can be the expansion of the universe or it can be uh, other processes like the second law of thermodynamics, the, the increasing disorder. But when you look at Einstein's equations for gravity, Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism, quantum equations for the three quantum forces, none of them have an era of time built into them. I thought there was two quantum forces. There's three? Uh, yes. Yeah. So you, you have... Uh, in, in the Strong, the weak, and the, I, th I thought that was it. There's another one in there now? Uh... So strong force, the weak force, electromagnetism, and gravity, right? Those yes, are the four yes, fundamental yes, but, forces. But in, in, yeah, but in, in the standard model, the, the three are eaten in a quantum way. So electromagnetism, oh, I yeah. I see, I see. Yeah. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So, so gravity is the only one that stands by itself. Because, right, because gravity, um, because, like, to me, like, I've always kind of imagined this, like, story in my brain that um and i actually got this from brian green because like i've i've been interviewing brian green now for almost 15 years and it's just like every time i ever talk to him it's always some new mind-bending thing um and and, and with brian green i, I he kind of put it in my head that when humanity discovers a a, a a kind of a quantum theory of gravity and you know that everything is going to change right that that there's going to be a, like a huge um like level of optimization to our understanding of the universe right because when you had newton first describe gravity we got like the industrial revolution and then you mm -hmm. had einstein optimize that a little bit then we got the nuclear revolution and now if we can optimize that even further by actually finding this graviton particle or observing it or whatever you know however mm -hmm. you know it works that it could really push things forward, but because that's where the conflict is, right? That gravity doesn't really play nice with quantum physics, right? Yes. And, yes. And, and, but, uh, yeah. Sorry. Go on. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. You go ahead. So uh, different people at, at the moment mean different things uh, or understand different things by uh, quantum gravity. Uh, Brian Green, who is a string theorist, would think that string theory is, is that leading candidate of uh, quantum theory, of uh, quantum gravity. Other people will say we don't know yet what quantum gravity is. So I, I'm not sure in, in, um, 
in in that uh, statement that uh, the next big leap leap in in physics will be the discovery of uh, quantum gravity i definitely agree with the time statement that if sure. we have a better understanding of time especially of uh, the big question which is all our theories all all the cherished theories of physics that we trust because we have tested them experimentally all of them do not have an era of time built into them yet the universe does so how can i have a set of laws of nature that are not aware of an era of time but they describe a universe that comes with an era of right. time and so do you think mystery do you think it's possible that there could be a a um a a quantum theory of time like you know like i think theoretically it's called the uh, the tachyon particle of, you know maybe i'm i'm just making that up from star trek but that there is a theoretical particle supposedly responsible for time uh, because if it's a fundamental power then there has to be a quantum basis for it right that's described in a unique particle with its own set of rules is that is that an accurate statement or can it be uh, fundamental without having a quantum um particle you know, yes 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 yeah, so um i i am not aware of uh, uh an association between time and and uh, a quantum particle there there are some um, uh, models of time crystals but uh, those are just uh, <laughs> building defects or structures in that background of time so building pulsations if you like of uh, uh, out of a time parameter as i said the, the problem is that in quantum mechanics time is not an operator it's not an operation it's not something that does something it's just a parameter that is put by hand. Um, there, there are many, many interesting uh, ideas there, especially from people like uh, David Deutsch, who has uh, done fundamental work in quantum computing um, about what is the implication of uh, this time parameter if we treat it quantum mechanically. Can we allow it to fluctuate? And what would that mean? for the energy, would, would it introduce an uncertainty in the whole energy at the beginning of the universe? So one one can can get into a deep discussion about that. As I said, we, we really don't know. To, yeah. You know, one question I've always had in my mind, and like, pardon me if these questions make no sense, but it's just like when you're not a mathematician, you're not a physicist, but you're obsessed with the kind of artistry of this world, you start mm -hmm. getting your own creative ideas about it. And I've always had this thought experiment in my mind that if you were to take an atom, right, and we know an atom has a nucleus and it has protons and neutrons orbiting around it, and, you know, um, you know that's what an atom is. If you eliminate time from that atom, does anything happen to the atom? Does the atom increase in temperature or decrease in spin? Like, is there an effect that happens if you were to eliminate time from an atom? Does that make when, any sense? Uh, when you say eliminate time from the atom, what do you mean? Like uh, not describe it in time? Like, like for example... Time is dynamics is the evolution, what happens to that object over time. So when we eliminate time, yeah. Right, so like if you were to take an atom and put mm -hmm. an atom in the same kind of singularity of a black hole, okay. that atom... Um, like ceases does it cease to exist does it just stop being what it was does it like if it's a hydrogen atom for I example understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah inside of a singularity what is the state mm -hmm. of it at that point well okay let let me i mean um when it comes to the singularity it's uh we, we have no idea because uh, our equations break down but let let me find right. a milder version of, of that situation a universe which is going to be our universe completely dominated by energy. Mm -hmm. So there, there is nothing else, just energy. That kind of universe is, uh, it has a name, it's known as a Sitter universe. It has constant temperature and constant entropy, just like a black hole. So that means no disorder is allowed in that universe. Mm. If you put that hydrogen atom in that universe, since you are not allowed to change the temperature or create any fluctuations or increase any disorder, then nothing will happen to that atom. It is a static object that is not even allowed to fluctuate quantum mechanically. Mm. 
So it doesn't exist. It basically doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So when you eliminate time, cause that's a, like, that's a, that's a, that's a, a consequence of, of, of extreme mass and energy. Yeah. Um, atoms are no longer allowed to behave the way that they were before. That's correct. And then that's known as cosmic heat death. Wow. Okay. <laughs> because uh, the second law of thermodynamics says uh, entropy disorder increases over time. But if you have such a universe that has only energy and nothing else, so disorder cannot is not allowed to, to continue increasing anymore, then clocks stop. You, you can't build a clock. You cannot measure change or passage of time out of a system where nothing changes. So time stops there, clock stops, and uh, therefore all, all these atoms that we would like to put in there, they go through this uh, cosmic heat death. And, and uh, you know, first of all, this is this is such amazing stuff. And thank you so much, Laura. I'm learning so much from this stuff already. And like, I'm already thinking about the next things I want to go read, um, including your book that that you just released. So, the Arrows of Time is a textbook, but the newest book that you release is called Before the Big Bang, and that's the one that's out now, right? Yes, that's correct, and that's a popular science book. So, it, it, I hope it can be understood by everybody. <laughs> And, and, and like, what's your kind of big picture of why you wanted to write this book? Was it to articulate all the experiments that 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 you had been doing, or like, what was your kind of motivation for doing the book? Well, um, because of the uh, uh, experimental success with our predictions, uh, the the work, the theory has been in the news for for a decade. Uh, many, many science reporters in TV and radio and uh, science magazines were, were talking about it. So uh, sometimes a story that would be published in, in England or the US would then be translated into other languages. And every time right. that happened, it, it was tweaked just a little <laughs> bit more, and just a little bit more. So I, I, I felt that um, once I was happy that we were in the right track. I mean, it, it took a, a decade of convincing myself, getting, deriving an answer mathematically to, to these kind of big questions does not at any point mean that what I'm saying is the right story that happened in nature. So I, I was completely aware with that. But once those uh, uh, experimental data came along and, and they, they seemed to, to be exactly to find the anomalies in the sky at exactly the sizes and the distances that uh, we had predicted a decade, uh, decade earlier, then that gave me hope that maybe I'm on the right track. And, and at, that, at that point, uh, it, it was a, a matter of telling my own story so that even if that story got tweaked in some translation of, of some other story, then uh, at least people could always go back to the book and refer to it to, to, um, to, to see what, what I had done and what, what I was claiming. Another um, reason was also to share that passion sure. of science and discovery with, with the younger generation because, uh, I mean, I, I see I have a, a daughter in uh, middle school and uh, I'm surrounded by, by kids in the neighborhood as well and, and I am a professor so I teach, I, I, I live among the, the younger generation and, and I can see all too often the difference between my generation and, and the one now, all the social media and the internet and the Twitter and the Facebook and, and all of that while great for spreading the news across continents very fast, it's also taking time away from that passion that drives unencumbered amounts of time. I mean, when, when sure. it comes to, to solving these problems and, and to studying these questions, you can't do them in five minutes or through Facebook. You, you have to sit and be prepared to spend many nights without sleep until you get to the answer. And I just wanted to demonstrate that that kind of dedication is completely worth it because what you get at the end cannot, that feeling of discovery cannot be compared with anything else. Yes. Amen to that. That's a beautiful way of looking at it. Um, have you noticed, because you're, you're a professor of physics at uh, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, that's an awesome school 
very what you know very good reputation have you noticed a trend up staying the same or down in terms of the amount of students enrolling in your courses and taking physics as like a serious career path is, is that something that people are getting more excited about the same or dropping what what's kind of your take on it Probably the same. I mean, physics majors is, and 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 there are many reasons to that. The the size of the department and the funding we have determines how many students we accept as uh, as majors. So that that number has, has increased slightly, but not tremendously. So it's not mm -hmm. a uh, significant. Uh, right, right. So, so so you're saying that it's hard to to like see a trend. Yes. Because it's always the same because of the funding. Yeah, yeah. And then the yeah. size of the departments and the school, it's uh, how many professors can teach those courses. Yeah. Because, but, uh, yeah. You, you know, because like one time I interviewed um, um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and, mm -hmm. and he gave me a very interesting point of view that I've never been able to shake also, which is like back when the U.S. was at war uh, with Russia or in the Cold War with Russia mm -hmm. that, you know, the U.S. used to spend and it like an incredible amount of money into, you know, through the Department of Energy into physics study. And like, you know, there was a super collider being built in Texas mm -hmm. that was like four times the size of the one at CERN and could produce way more energy. And this was like 40 years ago. And after the Cold War kind of chilled out that mm -hmm. like our, our four, you know, like our our time spent on, on on that kind of research dropped, you know, drastically. Um, have you seen a trend in the overall physics space of a lack of sort of discovery where it's kind of stagnated, or is it, or new things still being discovered all the time? What? Yeah. How, no, how I'm, I'm very glad you asked that question about funding and uh, um, the in in terms of funding, I, I've seen it in my. Uh, uh, working life as a professor, funding going uh, down, especially for basic research. And, mm -hmm. and one cannot have applied research without doing basic research. In applied physics, you are applying discoveries that were done in fundamental physics. And uh, there, there is truth to, to, uh, to, to that uh, statement by, by uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson that, well, you see some other countries, for example, uh, China. Mm -hmm. Before we were in a Cold War with uh, the Soviet bloc and, and there was a lot of uh, funding for, for physics and science in the U.S. and a lot of discoveries. Do they go hand in, in hand? Absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. if you decrease the funding, then the discoveries and, and the number of people you are training to make those discoveries will go down. So this trend of, of science funding on, going down, especially on basic research, is really a very dangerous trend because this yeah. is the, sci uh, the century of science and technology. Until now, uh, in this country, we have been at the forefront of cutting edge sure. research. We have led the world. And then always industrial applications of those discoveries that were made here follow. Yeah. And, and that allowed us to maintain that first place in, in leading the world. Uh, we don't want to lose that. I mean, when, when you compare that to, to how much uh, funding uh, China, for example, is, is uh, devoting to, to training their physicists and, and to, to uh, basic research. Sure. Sure enough, they, they do that because they went through the cultural revolution in the 60s and, and 70s. So their cultural revolution wiped out three generations of um, physics students and physics professors and the next generation of uh, physics teachers. So they needed in order to rebuild that broken tradition, they, they needed to invest a lot. But yeah. when you compare the, the, the increase in their science funding, and how quickly they are catching up in, in, uh, from sending people to the moon or, 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 uh, or to Mars sure. and building their own space station to everything else. You, you can see how proportionally science funding goes next to science scientific achievements. And in that race, and it is a race, yeah. we don't want to come second place in that. We, we want to continue to always be at the forefront and, and uh, the leaders in, in discoveries and in applications. We, we are lucky because we, we, all, 
we never broke the tradition. We didn't have a cultural revolution there. So we don't want to break that tradition by decreasing science funding. We, we want to take advantage of the great infrastructure of all the schools and, and everything else and generations of, of uh, stellar scientists in order to train the next generation and support them to make discoveries. Yeah, because, you know, the last major discovery in physics um, that I think became like extremely uh, uh, popular news was obviously when everybody was talking about the Higgs particle and the discovery at CERN. And, you know, people named it the God particle and all this stuff and completely misunder. Like if you ask anybody, they probably heard of the God particle. They have yeah. no idea what, what, what it actually does and its effect on the standard model and, and like what its discovery was actually about. But lately, there was the LIGO experiment here in the U.S. that was able to detect, you know, gravity waves, which, yeah. you know, I, um, I, uh, uh, God, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name right now, who also um, wrote a book about the arrow of time. Um, oh, God. Anyway, I'm sorry. He, he's a professor at UC Berkeley. I can't believe I just forgot his name. I'm sorry. But, 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 but in any case, the... He, he was explaining to me um, that the the discovery at LIGO of, of 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 actually detecting and being able to mark down the gravitational waves from a black hole, God knows how far away, was the closest we'll get to quantum um, proof of gravity. That like beyond discovering gravitational waves, it'll be very difficult for us to ever create energy high enough to detect a graviton particle inside of a anti you know like a matter collision is mm -hmm. that something that makes any sense to you or am i just uh, i'm not sure about that because uh, there are also gravitational waves being produced at the big bang and the next generation of uh, these cmb experiments i, I mentioned planck and wmap before mm. but the next generation of this uh, uh, CMB experiments will go after those uh, gravitational waves. Sean Carroll is his name. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sean Carroll is yeah, his I name. Yeah, I know Sean well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Sean, yeah. for forgetting your name there for a second. Mm -hmm. But but, but I'm sorry. Continue. So, so you're saying that there's other experiments that are also successfully detecting gravitational waves. Uh, that will successfully detect, yes. Uh, so the next source of uh, the wealth of information will come from gravitational waves from the Big Bang. And how, what, what practical sort of applications does detecting gravitational waves give us in optimizing our understanding of gravity? If, if the big picture is to unite gravity with quantum physics, right? And gravity mm -hmm. is, I'm assuming what you're referring to as classical physics is really gravity, you know, Einstein, mm -hmm. Newton, you know, yes, type stuff. Yes, yes. So, if we understand gravitational waves and we can prove that they're real and we can detect them, how does that bring us closer to merging the two? So you are asking me to anticipate when the, the next discovery will be made. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, forget that. Forget that question. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, uh, we have no doubt about the uh, gravitational waves because you can see them as ripples in a pond. It, it's, uh, it's there for certain. And, and yeah. uh, LICO is very sensitive as an experiment, so they can detect those ripples. To, to amazing accuracy. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the bending of light that was done uh, by Eddington in, in uh, proving Einstein correct, that, that's an example of, uh, of the effect of gravity. The fact that if you go, um, if light goes near a very massive star, it will bend. And that has been measured for a long time. Now we can measure ripples in, in the fabric of mm -hmm. space time, which is the gravitational waves that uh, LIGO is detecting from, again, from very massive objects like uh, black holes. So uh, does that help us uh, understand gravity better? I'm not sure about that because mm -hmm. in all, in extracting data from all those experiments, we are using Einstein's equations that describe sure. gravity. So perhaps any deviation I see. from what we expect to, to shed light in, in, in to hint to us where is the right direction where these two theories might merge. But if everything else keeps 
agreeing with Einstein's equations, then uh, I'm not sure how that can help us. And and with 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 quantum, I'm sorry, with uh, with uh, with string theory, and the mathematics around string theory, and you know the need for string theory to have you know, 11 dimensions and, and all of those variables that are required for string theory to make sense mathematically. Does, does, if you were to assume, okay, string theory is true, right? Thought experiments, string theory is true. Does okay. the string theory application change Einstein's equations of gravity? Does it no. alter them in any way? No. So, I mean, that that's why uh, string theory is indeed the leading theory of, uh, uh, quantum gravity at the moment is the closest we, we get to that one because it does succeed in unifying gravity to the other three forces of uh, nature. Um, it does so in higher dimensions. So that, that's the price one pays. Instead of uh, four dimensions, time, width, length, and height, then you are imagining time plus 10 space dimensions. So, so in that sense, you are writing, rewriting Einstein's equations, but in higher dimensions. Mm. Um, it, it doesn't go against Einstein's equations. It, it was built on Einstein's stream of, of unifying gravity to all the other forces. Um, the interesting part that I find is that uh, considering that, that uh, the, the dream of string theory was to end up with this unified picture of gravity plus all the, the other forces in nature under one umbrella theory, and then to reduce dimensionally, to get rid of the seven extra dimensions in order to produce a four dimensional universe like the one we see around us. That would have been beautiful because that, that was Einstein's uh, dream. We would have one theory and we would get our four dimensional universe described by that theory. What happened? as uh, I describe in the book, is uh, instead of one universe, uh, string theory ended up uh, deriving <laughs> an, a nearly infinite number of such right. universes, the whole landscape of uh, string theory. But then when, when um, you think about that, why should that bother us? Why should we find that mind-boggling or find it a crisis or distasteful or whatnot? Yeah, it makes yeah. I, I think it's uh, the the best way, at, at least in in my experience, the best way to to approach science and and uh, especially when it comes to fundamental questions about the very fabric of the universe and yeah. nature it is to go into the problem completely uninhibited. So. If I'm surprised that uh, string theory gave me a, a whole landscape of universes, that simply means that I was inhabited by an assumption or, or an expectation that I only wanted one universe. Sure. If I drop, if if I drop any expectations, but let the the theory and then let uh, nature lead me to the right answer, then uh, I wouldn't have been sur surprised that I ended up with a whole landscape of those. Yeah, I I am. Um... Because for me, I had this kind of thought experiment in my head that, you know, since we don't know what, what happens, you know, at the center of the black hole and at the singularity, that every single black hole that we see in space, and this is just, you know, like a little kid thinking, but was actually a the other side of another Big Bang, that every black hole creates a big bang in like an alternate you know, dimension of space or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and that basically, you know, that's how we started, right. The, you know, that, that, that we come from a big bang and every black hole you see out there has other universes on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that to your point brings up the idea of time, right? Because that means that there's a scattered, like timing of of universes being created and every time a star collapses a new universe gets created there there's no possible truth to that right like like uh i i don't know uh, what you said about being a little kid uh, that's what i was trying to to say before that if we all approach these big questions in a very uninhibited way like a little kid that sees the world for the first sure. time that that's the best way to to really make progress without um, 
um, without constraining your your thinking. Right. But uh, in terms of black holes having another universe on on the other side, there there are such theories. Lee Smolin is is one of uh, of the people that uh, have thought of connecting at at the throat of a, of a black hole connecting two universes. So one universe would be born out of the singularity of the black hole. I I have um, no I, no new thing to add to the story. And, and it's not just the, the question of time. I mean, we, we really don't know what's at the singularity. So one can make models where you cut off that area, that region of the singularity, and, and you glue that space, that small space time, to another space time of, of a growing universe. So can one build those geometrically? Absolutely. Sure. And then that's what uh, Lee showed. How how much truth is in that proposal? It is hard to tell because yeah. again, in, in but, science you need proof, not, not just a, a good idea. Sure. And to that point, just to go back to your work, uh, and, and I'm sure, you know, um, you know, once I dig deeper into Before the Big Bang, um, your book, I'll have a better understanding of this. But according to your work, the way that you look at it is that all of the multiple universes started at the same time, that they started in concert with the Big Bang and with our current universe, and they're identical to each other. Um, like, do the same rules of physics apply, or is it possible that the that the kind of um, God, I forget what Einstein called it, but the the constants are different in these universes, or or is it all the same? That that's uh, that's another hard question. I mean, this sure. work and, and that of uh, my colleagues uh, has just pushed multiverse in, into mainstream physics. So it's too early to tell what the larger structure of the multiverse looks like. In in my case, I was looking at that sector of the multiverse where all these branches of the wave function that are entangled with each other, they are not identical because they are sitting at different points on the landscape. So they all start at different energies. And I was just following the evolution of each of those. Some that sit at very shallow energies can ever grow and produce a universe. Some others at very high energies will explode like ours did and, and follow a similar story. Now, are the laws of nature and the constants of nature, like um, the electron mass, the, the proton mass, the electron charge, the Newton's constant, the fine right. structure constant, are those the same in, in every universe, in this multiverse? I, I don't know, because we still don't have a uh, classification of what the multiverse looks like at the largest possible scales. It's completely feasible that the laws of nature and the constants of nature might very well vary across the, the multiverse. And I, I try to make sense in some way, to, to order it in some way by uh, proposing two, uh, two principles. One was that of correlations. Basically, if, if certain universes in that multiverse are interacting with each other, are correlated with each other, then they must be part of the same space-time. They must be embedded in the same space-time. And then the other one was... Uh, a principle known as no perpetuum motion, motion to uh, try and make sense of the time parameter. Because what you're saying, first of all, what you're saying is fascinating. And thank you so much, doctor, for, for, for joining me today, because you've opened my mind even more, um, you know, that I have in a long time. So I really appreciate that. So thank you for that. But I think like when you hear guys like, for example, like, you know, somebody I like a lot and I have a ton of respect for, but when Joe Rogan, for example, talks about the multiverse, they always describe it as a, oh, there's a version of you that's wearing a black hat, but there's also a version of you where everything is the same in the entire universe, but you're wearing a white hat. And like, to me, that, that, that doesn't seem to jive with how, what I understand of the wave of probability and the collapse of that is mm -hmm. that yes, you could have put on a white hat, but you put on a black hat. So you reality is you have a black hat, but in your way of looking at the multiverse, these different universes have zero connection to us, except the effects that we see across our cosmic background radiation. Yes. From, from early on leftover from early on. When but besides were, that, there's no... Absolutely, and, and you're right. I mean, what you described about uh, wearing different hats is uh, the Everettian 
uh, picture of the multiverse. And and to be fair, at, at this time, I mean, he made a giant leap in, in saying, let's treat everything quantum mechanically and, and uh, have many worlds as a result. But uh, he applied something known as the principle of ignorance, where he gave equal weight to each of those options. So there can be another you in some parallel universe with an equal probability to you being here talking to me now, uh, doing something else in, in that other universe. However, uh, once the coherence, that decoupling, that, that wiping out of entanglement mm. uh, was discovered, and, and that was uh, uh, Dieter Zee, a, a German physicist, was one of the key figures on, on that in the 70s. Once you include the coherence into the into the picture. So you start quantum where every branch of the wave function can produce a universe like ours, but um, somehow along the way, something happens that happens that separates, decouples those waves from each other for good. It washes out their quantum nature, their entanglement. Once that decoherence happens, and then that's done through coupling with the bath, with an environment, but once that happens, then each one of those branches is pinned down to its own mm. classical identity. So there is no more splitting after that. You, each branch cannot continue creating more and more universes. And the way that the two universes are interacting with each other is via gravity. Is gravity creating these voids in space in that 10 degree angle mm. that you guys predicted? It's quantum entanglement, but but a, a way to picture that, yes, I mean, early on, you have got all these wave packets, all, all these branches that will become universes, and they've got matter and energy. So it's like having a bunch of Newton samples mm. pulling on each other, gravitationally, wow. yeah. And, and then how, you know, maybe this is too complicated to explain in a few minutes, but how did you arrive at this sort of 10 degree delta in in the you know background of space as the as the shape that you predicted and then were able to see like, like well, how I, did yeah I, I cannot um, describe the numbers but uh, the the way we calculated it you start before the big bang where you have got all these branches that are entangled to each other sitting at various points on the landscape you have got Newton's constant built into your equations it is always there because of Einstein's theory uh, you have also got the uh, Big Bang energy, the, the energy at which the universe blows up. Right, which we can predict because so, we can rewind it. Yeah, so you, you have got two numbers, two scales. Um, you follow what, what your branch is going to do as it goes through the Big Bang and later on fast forward to present day. How did that 10 degrees come across? Well. As you follow your branch and you follow it through the decoupling process at the Big Bang, the only numbers that, that you are using in your calculation are those two numbers, two scales, Newton's constant, the inverse of which is uh, Planck mass or Planck energy and um, uh, squared. And, and the energy at which inflation, this Big Bang switches on. So that number will be some ratio of these two numbers. That, that's the closest that I can get to. to <laughs> First of all, it's a very good Perhaps you, you have to look yeah. at it. In fact, uh, it's in two papers. In uh, It's called Avatars on, of the Landscape 1 mm. and 2. And uh, and uh, the two papers were published in 2005. So you, you can see the, the whole calculation and the derivation there of, of these cars. And in, in page 5, the very first paragraph will say, we predict that... Uh, a giant void will be at 10 degrees in the sky at these distances. Wow. So I'm very proud of that. That uh, we, we observed it in 2013, but you can actually read it in that paragraph. First of all, this has been <laughs> such an honor for me, Dr. Laura. This is amazing stuff. Uh, this is truly, truly amazing stuff. I I am horrible at math. And then, but Brian Green actually told me this. He's like, Mark, you're not horrible at math. Because you seem to understand it pretty well. You're horrible at arithmetic. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, this is such beautiful stuff. Um, so, okay. So um, your book before the Big Bang just came out, uh, The Origin of Our Universe. You go um, uh, into all of this stuff. And uh, yeah, this has been fascinating. The, the, the folks over at Chapel Hill are lucky to have you. Thank um, you. And thank you very much for sharing your time with us. Is there any... Um, 
you know, what one thing that I do want to ask you, because I always try to ask this from all my guests, is like if if you want to give encouragement to a young person to in, to go into this field, what's the typical advice that you give since you deal with so many young folks uh, getting into this uh, field? The, the advice is as long as, as you are passionate about understanding mm. these questions, everything else can be learned. I, I don't believe that there are smart people or, or dumb people. It's uh, mm. just people that didn't have the privilege to put the time behind learning these, these equations and, and those that did. So all of that, all, all Einstein's equations and all the math can be learned, but what really keeps you going, and, and it is hard work. It, it, it will require many months and years of, of uh, selfless dedication to, to understanding these questions. But as long as, as you have that passion that you really want the answer at all costs, the, the rest can be learned. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a true honor. Um, you can find the book. I'll leave the links. If you want to send me the links to these two papers, and I'd, I'd also would love okay. to include that if anybody wants to go down that rabbit hole. But uh, look, <laughs> hope, okay. yeah, hopefully we can chat again because like, I feel like I've just gone, gotten a whole you know, Chapel Hill education for free. So <laughs> that again, one day, uh, again, that would be awesome. So thank you so much, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.